but I felt the presence of this being next to me. I only had the sense that it was a being that I knew quite well. And uh, the being was communicating to me, I'm going to say telepathically. Yeah. My name is David Beckman. And um, my near death study or my near death experience happened actually in 1988, July 17th, 1988. Uh, I was on a whitewater rafting trip with five or six other friends. And I realized within moments that I was in a lot bigger trouble than I had anticipated because the current was so strong that it pulled me down and under. And then it it would shoot me over the uh, rocks in the so-called stair and then over these little waterfalls. And then it would roll me around at the bottom of this these little waterfalls. Uh, river runners call this being Maytagged, uh, like the washing machine. So you're being spun around down in this this dark eddy until the current finally kicks you out. And uh, as you're being spun around, you can be, you, you know, you're being shoved into rocks and um, it's all happening very fast and it's very powerful and there's very little you can do to help yourself. So uh, I realized after I went down a couple of these and I keep, I was bashed into rocks that I was probably in trouble. And uh, uh when the current tossed me out of these vertical eddies, I would I would start to see light up ahead of me and bubbles and hear the roar of the water because down below it was quite silent. I couldn't, I tried to uh, swim to the surface and I couldn't move my arms. So I tried kicking my way out to the surface and I couldn't move my legs. I was just totally exhausted and spent and bashed up. So I knew at that point that I probably wasn't going to make it. And I thought, well, the last thing that this river is going to take from me is my my last breath, and I'm not giving it to it while I'm conscious. And then in a few moments, waiting for everything to, waiting, waiting to die, essentially, I just felt myself in a moment sort of a whooshing, and I was somewhere else. And all of a sudden, I was in a place where there was no pain, there was no violence, in fact, I was not aware that I was in my body, but it was me. And I said to myself, what the hell just happened to me? And as I said that, there was, I would say, appeared. At this point, it's very difficult to describe correctly what happens. I don't think we have the words in our vernacular to be accurate about it. Time and space is different. Uh Obviously, whoever or whatever we are at that point are different, but I felt the presence of this being next to me. I only had the sense that it was a being that I knew quite well, and uh, the being was communicating to me, I'm going to say telepathically, that I was okay and that everything was going to be okay. And uh, and so I... Uh, I remember sort of following this being a little bit and it there was just a few, it felt like a few moments had transpired and suddenly I saw my entire life began to to play out in front of me and I saw it from three perspectives simultaneously and um I, I guess you could say the first was the way I viewed it, the way I had viewed it as I had lived it. The second point of view was sort of the um, this omniscient point of view where I was, I was experiencing it as though I were sort of floating above it and watching it. And the third point of view was was from the perspective of everyone with whom I had ever interacted. So my first memory of that review was when I was four years old, uh, I had a friend, uh, his name was John Arthur. <laughs> we lived on the East Coast and uh, there was a very distinctive East Coast, what would I call it, accent, dialect. And uh, so he called himself John Arthur. I would have called him John Arthur, but uh, at any rate, uh, John Atha had apparently uh, hit my younger brother, 
he's a year younger than I was, so he was only about three years old. And he came in crying, and I heard what had happened when he told me about it. So I went outside to go out and confront John Atha. And as I did, I went out the front door, saw him in his yard next door. He waved and smiled and started running over to me. And I decided to duck around the corner of the house. And as I did that, I saw a stick about maybe two feet long, maybe about three quarters of an inch or an inch around. I don't know what you'd call that in centimeters, three centimeters. And uh, uh, I picked up the stick. And as he came around the corner, I whacked him over the head with it. And he was very surprised and he grabbed his head and started screaming. And I felt the blow. I felt how he felt. And that was how we proceeded. So every time I had interacted with someone and I had caused them joy or pain, I felt what I had done. And there were obviously experiences that I was not proud of at all. In fact, I was quite ashamed. And as I turned my attention to this being who I felt was beside me, I received no judgment whatsoever. It was as though I, I was washed over by a sea of this unconditional love. And that whatever judgment there would that would take place would be from myself, but from the perspective of the being that I was, and not from uh, what I'll call an earthly perspective. And so it was more or less not so much right and wrong, but cause and effect. What did I learn from this? What can I take with me? Uh, that, that sort of thing. And uh, as I began to ask questions about all of this, the questions, the answers would flow into me. And the more questions and the answers that I, the more questions that I had and the more answers that flowed into me, the more questions that I had, because it was like being connected really to the universe's best internet. <laughs> there was, there was an instantaneous and full and satisfactory answer to everything I ever had a question about. So, uh, and it was as though I sort of had a new toy. It was, it was amazing. And I, and as I, as I had all of my questions answered, I was then told, you can stay or you can go. Your life isn't complete, but it's your choice. So uh, if you decide to stay here, there are agreements or maybe we can call them contracts with the other, I'm going to say other souls that I would interact with in my life in this lifetime and i would have to rearrange with these people a way to interact with them within some other lifetime if i didn't go back and complete this one now and i remember thinking uh i don't want to have to come back and do it again uh so i will i will go back and I felt regretful about it because it was, it was a place where you, okay, I'm going to say that I think on, on earth, we feel like whatever sort of divinity there is, it's somewhere else, whether it's in heaven or some other dimension or whatever. But from my experience in from this experience, it felt as though I were dwelling within the consciousness of God, and that we all did. We all do. That that it's like we're all sort of bobbing around this ocean that is God, and this this God is nothing but complete, unbelievable love, no judgment. Uh, and you, I had the sense that this this gigantic, all encompassing love was the power that created everything. So anyway, I didn't want to leave this, but I decided that I should, should the most expedient way of taking care of things was to go back. And so I made the decision to go back. And in the next moment, I found myself 
floating just under the surface down at the bottom of this this staircase and uh breck in the kayak i i i sort of see my friends as though i was sort of hovering above them and they all were ashen gray looking for me and breck found me he, he saw my orange life vest come down uh, through the channel and he grabbed it and he pulled me up and he started yelling at me to breathe and to grab a hold of this rope loop that was on the end of his kayak and he would tow me out what happened within the next couple of weeks was I was trying to process all of what had just happened to me and and trust me I was not at all certain um what had uh, I just knew that I'd had this very life-changing experience. What what I had been doing, I had trained as a journalist, trained as a reporter, but uh, jobs were increasingly difficult to get, and I got laid off from this company where I, that I had been working for. It was a company called UPI, United Press International. And but I got a job as an IBM sales rep, selling electronic typewriters and uh, word processing equipment. So I had been doing that for about a year, uh, nice lifestyle, but I wasn't happy. And what I had decided I was going to do was I was gonna go find a reporting job, no matter how humble, and start over again. So I turned in my resignation. And uh, the day after I did that, I received a letter from a friend over across the other part of the state. And it was, uh, they were telling me about a, a job as a reporter that had opened up over in their area, and they were wondering if I was interested. So, of course, I went and interviewed for it. And when I interviewed for it, I knew it was mine, and I got it. I would say we're all going to die. These bodies eventually will deteriorate to the point where it can't sustain life anymore. But they're not – this body is not me. So grateful that I have it. But it's not me. Who I am is me. <laughs> and and um, I knew that when I was outside of my body. And, and that's sort of, at least it's a piece of who we are. You know, our personality, our energy survives. And I would say when that time comes, uh, it's so much better than everyone has been taught. So much better. So I don't... I don't necessarily want to die, but when my time comes, uh, I'm ready. Uh, but I want to enjoy this lifetime as much as possible, knowing that it's just part of the journey. And so, and I'm not sure that fear of death or anything else really serves us. We, if we can find it within ourselves to to lean into whatever happens to us. And um, if I get a cancer diagnosis, you might have to ask me about it again, but something like that. But uh, I think that's, that's how we sort of have to approach life is that we're not here forever. So enjoy your family, enjoy life, enjoy breathing air and um, the sun and the things that we have. Well, I believe that we chose before we came here to experience certain things. And um, and that might sound like a very glib and unsatisfactory answer to a lot of people, but um, it's all about the choices that we made before and the choices that we make here now. And so, you know, things will happen to us um, that we don't understand here. We don't have the perspective here that we have on the other side, if that makes sense. So I might have chosen, for example, I've been married three times. Why would I have chosen that? <laughs> Why would I want to go through that? Uh, but apparently I wanted... I wanted to have those experiences. Um, I, I I love my life here. I love my fortune, my my good fortune. I'm healthy. 
Uh, I have lived a good life. I still, I, I live a very good life. I'm a very happy man. Uh, and uh, I hope that it continues, but I know that whatever happens going forward, it's part of the experience that I at some point chose, either over there before I came here or somehow um, chose that here now. I'm very close to nature and to nature's rhythms, and that makes me happy. And uh, and the wild animals, um, you know, are uh, prevalent here, and uh, it makes me happy that they're they're around me and they're not afraid of me. And we sort of live in this this coexistence. And um, I'm getting a signal from my oh yes <laughs> from my girlfriend. <laughs> uh, I I also enjoy working out. Uh, I believe that. You know, I'm 68. So at this point, your body has, you have to keep this body in shape. I eat well, I exercise. Um, I suppose every morning I go out and I meditate and, and, and sort of pray uh, uh, based on a Native American prayer. And so you know, I, I walk out and, and uh, I'm barefoot so I can feel the ground underneath me and try to connect with my with the the earth and the sky and the air and appreciate it and thank what I'll call what we all call I guess the god force or god or the creator I try to express my gratitude for what I have we humans have our good and bad traits and uh those of us who've been through this experience know that uh, know what's going to happen when this particular lifetime ends. And by the way, I had the sense that this was just one of many of my lifetimes, uh, that I wanted to try to come through this as, as well as I could. And that meant try to be as loving and forgiving and, uh, uh, not have a particular need to uh, to engage in a tit for tat relationship, uh, have to win some sort of conflict, that sort of thing. So I think that's one of the biggest changes. And I also sort of listen to my intuition much more because I would say, that's probably one thing I learned in one of my questions is, is that we all have this intuition and I'm pointing to my heart, my heart center, uh, and we should all trust it. And it should be the first and the foremost um, guide for us, no matter what other people may, uh, may think or may try to persuade us. To your audience, I would say, much love to each and every one of you and peace and live a good life. Love your family, love yourself.